everybody coming in here. Oh, please make sure to keep your video and your audio off so we can focus on our presenters and their great conversation, which I promise is going to be a great conversation. I've had a little sneak peek here while we were waiting for everything to get started. So um, yeah, I think everybody's in. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jenny, I'm with Anderson's Bookshop, and we'd like to welcome you to this virtual author event with Elizabeth Berg in conversation with Jessica Treadway. We're really glad to have you with us this evening. If, if you're here in Chicago, it's kind of a cold and all of a sudden feels like winter evening, so it's nice to sit down and cozy up with some book talks. Um, but uh, we appreciate you taking the time to keep your eyes on another screen. There's a lot of demands on your time right now, and we appreciate you spending the evening with us. For those of you who are not familiar, Anders's is an independent uh, bookstore outside um, Naperville, uh, outside Chicago, Naperville, Illinois, excuse me. And uh, we um, have actually been selling books since 1875. We are actually owned and run by the Anderson family. We're going on six generations now of Andersons being involved. So um, this is very personal to us. When you support um, our events and purchase from us, it means a great deal. We like to say, in, in before times, we used to say, we find it here, buy it here, keep us here. And that has a bit of a different meaning now. Um, you know, find it here, buy it here, and we'll still be here when this is all dissipated is the word I heard someone use recently, which feels um, a bit more accurate than past, right? We're gonna have, be, we're dealing with this for quite some time. So we just like to take a moment to say thank you for being with us and for your support um, as guests and also of our authors, because that helps, uh, that helps us survive. We have been joking that we survived the 1918 pandemic, the flu pandemic, so we have to survive this one as well. There's just no question. So, um, so normally we would be doing this in person, um, of course, with the over 400 events that we normally do in a regular old average year. But of course, we're pivoting that to virtual now. So um, we normally, um, until we can be together again, we hope that this ties everybody over. We do have a bunch of other things coming up. So please check out our website. Um, this has been quite the big week. We started with John Grisham. We had Vivian Howard last night. We have Elizabeth this evening. And um, we're kind of taking a pause next week and having things focus on the country as you will. But the week after we're jumping right back into it, we're gonna learn how to make cocktails with one of the editors from Milk Street and uh, we've got all kinds of other things going on. Yes, we think we'll all need it by then, right? So um, all kinds of fun things going on. Please follow us online uh, in any way that is comfortable with you so that you don't miss anything that would be another great hit for you. But this evening, we're so happy to welcome uh, Elizabeth and Jessica. I'm going to read their official uh, bios to you so we get all of their great um, accomplishments in one official thing. So first, our moderator, Jessica Treadway, has published four novels and two story collections, the most recent of which, Please Come Back to Me, received the Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction. Her novel, The Gretchen Question, came out in June. She is on the writing faculty at Emerson College and is a former member of the board of directors of Penn New England, where she co-chaired the Freedom to Write Committee. She has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Foundation, and she has been an Elizabeth Berg fan for more than 30 years. <laughs> And our, uh, our author this evening, Elizabeth Berg, is the author of many best-selling novels, including The Confession Club, Night of Miracles, The Story of Arthur Truly, Open House, which was an Oprah's Book Club selection, Talk Before Sleep, and The Year of Pleasures, as well as the short story collection, The Day I Ate Whatever I Wanted. Durable Goods and Joy School were selected as ALA Best Books of the Year. She adapted The Pull of the Moon into a play that enjoyed sold-out performances in Chicago and Indianapolis. Her work has been published in 30 countries, and three of her novels have been turned into television movies. She's the founder of Writing Matters, a quality reading series dedicated to serving author, audience, and community. She teaches one-day writing workshops and is a popular speaker at venues around the country. Some of her most popular Facebook postings have been collected in Make Someone Happy, Still Happy, and Happy to Be Here. She lives outside Chicago. And of course, we are here this evening to discuss um, her newest book. Um, I'll be seeing you. Sorry, all the titles just swam in my brain. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. And we really look forward to this conversation. Welcome, ladies. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and I'd like to say that I added that line about being an Elizabeth Bird fan for more than 30 years to my official uh, biography because I actually was a fan of Elizabeth Bird before her first novel was published. And <laughs> I remember Elizabeth um, that talking on the phone to you and you said, I just wrote the first line of my novel you, and you read it to me and it was, well, I have broken the toilet. <laughs> and your, your fans, I think will recognize that as the first time that we hear from Katie Nash and Durable Goods. And in preparation for tonight, I was thinking about that and I thought, why is that moment so vivid to me? Why do I have such a vivid memory of where I was sitting when you read that to me? 
And then I thought, it's really not such a mystery at all. It's just, it's a great line. You, you put us right into the story. You give us a voice that uh, I would follow anywhere the same way I would follow your voice in this beautiful new memoir. And um, so I, I just, uh, it makes sense that, that in the memoir, the same thing happens as with the fiction. And I have a lot of things to say that I would say about I'll be seeing you, um, but I can't do justice to it the way the book itself can. So Elizabeth, I wondered if you would mind starting us off reading from the book, if you would. I, I would be glad to, but um, I can I just squeak in that I'm so glad to do this with Jessica. Jessica Treadway is a writer I have admired for just that long. And you can, you can get an email from Jessica telling you she's going to the grocery store and it will be a keeper. Oh. So um, I'm truly honored. And um, I remember reading to you from Joy School. Um, and, and I remember it that vividly. I remember sitting at my desk in, in outside of Boston and looking out at the garden and, and reading it to you and you were laughing and it was, so, it was such, it, it made me feel okay about what I was writing. It, it, was, it was really a, a, a go ahead and write this thing moment for me. And you've done that for me so many times. So thank you. Well, likewise, thanks a lot. That's enough about you, Jessica. That's enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so when I look at a book that I'm thinking about reading, I give it the old flip test, which means that um, I flip through it and I read here and I read there. And what if I read engages me and all the places I flip to, then I buy it. So um, I wanted to give you a sense of what the voice was like in this book. It's a memoir, it's nonfiction, it's deeply personal. Um, and so I, I'm going to just read you a little from uh, toward the very beginning. The failing of an aging parent is one of those old stories that feels abrasively new to the person experiencing it. At 89 years of age, my father has begun, in his own words, to lose it. This is a man who was for so many years terrifying to me. He was tall and fit, a lifer in the U.S. Army, whose way of awakening me in the morning when I was in high school was to stand at the threshold of my bedroom and say, move out. He was never quick to smile. He put the fear of God into every young man I dated in high school. And if he said to do something, you did it immediately, no excuses. He yelled at us a lot. And like many men of his generation, he believed in corporeal punishment. Over the years, he mellowed, though he was still quick to rise to anger if the occasion seemed to call for it. But he mellowed. And none of us who really knew him could help it. Not only did we love him, we liked him. The most striking thing about him was his truthfulness. The man would never lie. And he was a big softy when it came to animals and to my mother. She was the place where he put his tenderness he had a dry sense of humor and he was vastly intelligent. But now, my mother says he sits sometimes with his hands over his face, unmoving, and she thinks he is depressed. Also, she has noticed things happening more and more often, a repetition of questions that she has already answered many times over, a kind of paranoia. He claims things have been taken from the glove compartment of the car he no longer drives. My mother finds him in the closet of the TV room and he says he's looking for someone who came out of there to mess with things on his TV tray. When the lid of the garbage can goes missing after a day of high winds, he says it must be hooligans in the neighborhood. Better call the police. The last time I talked to my mother on the phone, she said, this is the best one yet. The other day, your father said, what's the matter with us? We don't get along like we used to. Are you seeing someone else? So um, that's, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, you're reading that passage makes me think of something I know about when you did write Durable Goods, your first novel, right? The, the one that mm -hmm. I was talking about. Um, and I think you were, uh, you were using your own experience. It was fictionalized, but you were using your own experience of being 
an army brat. I think that's using your own language. Is that, is mm-hmm. that fair? Mm-hmm. And you were um, worried about publishing that, I think, at the time. Yeah. That right. Um, and I think the same is true with this this memoir. And and yet I know there is a story that you have about, um, you know, talking to your father in advance of the publication of that book and, and the effect it had on your relationship. I wondered if you wanted to talk about that. Sure. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of full circle, isn't it? I, I did have trepidations about publishing durable goods, just as I did with this one, neither of them were meant to be published really. Um, well, especially this one, this one, I'll be seeing it was written. I, I had to write things out because frankly, I was getting confused about what my parents wanted. They were going back and forth and back and forth. And um, also a lot of things were happening that were weighted for me. And I wanted to explore those feelings with durable goods. I wrote a uh, part of an essay about what it feels like to grow up afraid of your father, terrified of your father. And there was so much in that nonfiction, of course, essay. I thought this, I think this is a novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did write it as a novel and there was a lot that was fictionalized, but there was a lot that was true as well. After I finished it, after in fact I had after I knew I could get it published, I told my mom about the book and I told her, I want to send it to you. And if you think there's anything in there that will hurt dad, that he won't understand, let me know. And I won't publish it. I I know I can write more books. So I sent it to her (laughs) in secret. She kept it under the bed and she read it and she called me and she said, I think you'd hurt your father more if you didn't publish it, if you passed up this opportunity. So I published it, obviously, and um, when he read it, it was a little tense. Uh, He asked my mother, was I this bad? And she said, you were pretty bad. (laughs) Um, But what it ended up doing was bringing us closer together because it got it into the open. And it facilitated a conversation that was long overdue. And it was after he read that book that we became very close and stayed very close up until his death. I, I love that story. And to me, it's kind of a, a, a measure of a, an illustration of what can happen. I know you um, advise people to be as honest as they can in their writing, or in, in, and, but that there's a risk to that. There's a risk to the vulnerability. And I'm imagining, since I've only written fiction and not a memoir, that it must feel even more vulnerable to write a memoir. I don't know if that's true in your case or not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, I, I, I think maybe you share this view that even when you're writing fiction, it's true to be emotionally honest. It, and and in this case, I'm I'm trying to remember the facts of things, and I'm, and I'm trying to really lay bare the feelings of, uh, of, of everyone, um, my own as I remember, others as I imagine them to have been, and um, to, to let people know that although this can be an extremely diff- difficult time, my dad got Alzheimer's, my parents had to move from their home of 45 years to one of those places, as my mother would call it. It was independent living, but still it was one of those places. Um, there's, there's a lot you go through. There's a lot that comes up that, that you might not have anticipated having to do with sorrow and rage and frustration and confusion and the way that you can't seem to get anywhere sometimes. I wanted to be honest about all of that stuff. There's there's stuff in this book that I'm certainly not proud of, ways I behaved that I wish I hadn't. But what I found um, in, in looking at reviews thus far is that readers do appreciate that because it makes them feel not so alone, because they may be experiencing the same things themselves. Why, why am I feeling this anger? Why did I behave that way? Um, it's, it's part of the package, I guess. And what helped me most when I was going through all this with my parents was hearing other people's stories. That's what I, I, I know you said that that was the inspiration for, 
for writing it and, and for publishing it, I guess that's bearing public witness to it, right? And letting people in. And I love the line in this book. There's, there's, there's so much, there's so much wonderful stuff in this book. Everybody has to read it. You'd be um, really doing yourself a favor. Um, I love the line about uh, talking to a writer about meals in China and how there's always a sharing plate. And my immediate thought when I came to that, and I knew the inspiration for this book was, this is, this is your contribution to the sharing plate. Is that right? I mean, that's what- Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think that any, hard time we go through. Um, Jessica, you and I have both had cancer. And when I when I was diagnosed, you were such a source of comfort for me. And um, I remember going to, uh, it was a seminar for people with cancer. And it was the first time I was able to put my shoulders down, you know, and, and kind of relax into the reality of it and to understand that that this too was part of life and that there were ways of dealing with this, of coping with it, of understanding it, of even trying to embrace the life lessons that you learned from such a thing. So um, sharing, um, sharing stories is, it must go back to the cavemen guys, you know? I had a bad day out there with a woolly mammoth. Really, I did too, you know? Yeah, that makes that makes sense. You know, as you're speaking, it also makes me think of a quote I heard from Cheryl Strayed. Is that how you pronounce her name? Do you know? Yes, um, it's Strayed. Wrote that wonderful uh, memoir, Wild, um, and she said something about she wrote, "Being surprised by beauty is one of the things I love most about writing about painful experiences. Almost always, what you find when you dig down," she says, "into that sorrow is that there is also beauty there." Oh wow, that gives me chills it really does i'm surprised you haven't heard it because it seems that you wrote a book that exemplifies that i've i've heard you know i've i've read I, she wrote by the way a, a beautiful novel about her mother also rich with sorrow but also with beauty um the name the name is escaping me right now but cheryl strayed look it up the the novel that she wrote and and uh and i read wild too she's a wonderful writer and person um but but hearing you read it, Jessica, just amplifies everything I, I feel about that. And, uh, and so well, it's important, right? Because it's easy <laughs> it's easy for me when I'm alone to get into the habit of thinking it's all bad, it's all bad, it's all bad, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just kind of steadily go down. And that's what what I hear you talking about is. Um, both in the company of others, whether it's physical in the before times or, you know, via Zoom or, or with a book, that that seems to be um, a way that people can, you know, communicate with each other and, and find community. And I know that that's what I found in your book. One of the, my favorite things about reading your book, and I was trying to think about how to say this, but I could be both myself, the reader, and you, the author, um, while I was reading it, and you referred to it as a deeply personal but universal um, story, you know, what you were going through. I mean, everybody's specific and practical experiences, I guess, would be different, you know, in terms of what they might be dealing with. Um, but I, I felt the sympathy for you as, as your experience resonated with my own. In my own case, you know, in, in our family, it was with my, uh, my, my husband's parents more recently. Um, but there were things I thought, I said, oh yes, that seems exactly the same. And I was actually, um, I, I did some, I looked at a couple of former interviews. I was a, a little bit surprised only because I didn't love his books, uh, Carl Uwe Knauskar, his six volumes of what I think are called auto, autobiographical novels. But I think you said you did. And maybe I didn't give him a chance, but the difference that I really honestly felt between the two were that I felt that in your writing, you were trying to connect. It wasn't a desperate attempt at connection. It was more of a, here's my story. I love that, that line from Mary, the Mary Oliver to, uh, poem, tell me about despair yours and I will tell you mine. That yeah. one was often yeah. popped in my head. And so I felt that you were kind of operating, you know, with that ethos, whereas with, with him, I kind of feel like he couldn't care less whether I 
connected or not with with what he was writing, which is not to say there isn't value there, but it's probably a different value. I I definitely just felt that you know I could I I could um, feel for you with your specific that what you were specifically going through and find the comfort that that you were talking about. That is such an interesting comparison. I, I do love those books. Um, and for those who have not, again. <laughs> not read them, Carl Uwe Nosgaard. But I think you're correct. I think that that when I wrote this book, I was I was sitting there trying to reach out um, and to connect. And and he just says, you want to follow me around? I'm going to go make <laughs> some coffee. Come on, you can watch me make some coffee, if he even says that much to you. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the reasons I love reading him is he's so handsome. But I don't know, um, I, I guess I, I, you don't want to talk too much about him, but just to say that I don't know how he does what he does. And it might be like cilantro, like you really like that kind of writing or you really don't. Um, but there is something so engaging about him. And, and I know that empirically, I know he's just talking about putting cream in his coffee, but I am riveted. Oh, look, he's putting cream in his coffee. So he's, he's a very interesting guy. And I know that some people love that. And I, I guess I just resonate and readers like me maybe resonate more to the person who is, you know, trying to, to make the bridges, which I just yeah. see this, this book as being very much. And, and because you have written fiction before now exclusively right this is your first memoir I mean when I when I met you you had been writing um I was thinking this is also interesting to me was you had been writing articles about being a parent of yeah. young children yeah. and it's cause talk about a circle again because when we can talk about what Julie said to you um you know in terms of um pushing your mother too much and she'll she'll <laughs> she'll do things when when she's ready which sounded to me like something a grandmother might say to her or mother might say to her daughter about a grandchild. So I loved that layer of it. But I was curious since since you mostly have written fiction, if you thought about using this same material uh, in fiction or did you never consider that and you thought, no, it's, it's going to be a memoir? No, I never considered making this fiction, but I, I do think that the same techniques that you use in writing fiction apply here. Um, you know, witness your emails, Jessica. I mean, I mean, if you're a, a good writer like you are, uh, you and you pay attention to detail and irony and and um, and poignancy and you know everything that's given to us as human beings. All of that gets put in what you're writing, or at least for me, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I, I. I want to. I want you to see my dad's recliner, or, or his slippers, or or the way he held his finger out to <clears throat> his beloved parakeets. You know, all that stuff uh, for me makes a story come alive and and puts me in the room with with the writer, and that's where I want to be. Absolutely, and you know, when you talk about poignancy, I have to say this is not about your parents, but one of the most poignant moments I found in this book is about. Uh, Walter, that's his name, right? That's the yes. Name gave him yes. I suddenly thought, um, and I was in. I, I mentioned him because, and I don't want to give too much away, but but you gave the name Walter to the gentleman of a couple, an elderly couple that you saw at the symphony. Uh -huh. Right? Do you want to talk about that a little? And sure. Um, I'm so glad you uh, resonated to that because that's one of my favorite things in the book. And it's just a moment, you know, it's just an encounter I had with this older couple. But, but that interaction um, served the whole book. It was, it was metaphorical and it was... Um, and it was such a, a beautiful physical example of a kind of longing that I had. What we're talking about is, is a couple that I sat behind at the symphony and she called him Walter. So I, I know uh, his name was Walter. And uh, it was with great difficulty that they had come. He had a walker and he was quite frail. I think they were almost 90. Um, and and um, when when everything was over and the crowd was madly applauding, Walter got up shakily, you know, got his walker and began 
the long walk up that aisle and it was so slow. It seemed literally inch by inch, but he did it. And I know that the people, I knew that the people were clapping for the, for the symphony, but in my heart, I made it be for him. Um, and um, that's, I, it was so valiant. I, I loved that I got to see that. It's a beautiful moment. And even though it isn't talking specifically about your parents, it tells the reader, this is the kind of sensibility, this is the kind of person that we're hearing from writing about. And I, I just in terms of, I was, I, I thought about that moment and I thought, because I'm a writer too, I think I also notice moments like that. I don't necessarily write about them. I think probably there are a fair number of people in the world, maybe at that symphony, who might have also witnessed it, might have felt the poignancy, but you know, wouldn't have the means or the language to write about it and share it in the way that you have. So I think of that as, as one of the gifts that you've been giving us for all these many years and particularly in this book, um, seeing things that might be ordinary, you know, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say that what happens in the book to your family is ordinary and extraordinary just by virtue of, you know, the fact that um, everybody came together, everybody had um, you know, the, the well-being of your parents at heart and, you know, um, but it's probably, it's not dramatic, you know, necessarily, but it, they are those small life moments that, that happen. And I mean, of course it's dramatic, you know what I mean, but it's, it's yeah. more yeah. important to the people who are involved in it. And um, so I, I, I also was, was interested in the fact that the book um, is not just about your parents and about what you went through, you and your siblings and, you know, others in the mm -hmm. family, you know, mm -hmm. I know it's not just mm -hmm. you, but you also talk about how it's about aging yourself mm -hmm. and ourselves. And um, I have a, a friend, Marianne Leone, who wrote an essay about, uh, she started it off by saying something like, well, I'm a woman over 60, which means I am invisible. Yeah. And I and I was listening to your interview with our friend Jenna Blum yesterday, and and I was interested in hearing you say, you know, in our culture, in our world today, we don't honor age, we hide it. Mm -hmm. But when I heard that, and I heard you talking about it, I I suddenly realized that uh, we don't, we may not as a society honor it, but but we're not invisible to each other, and we're certain certainly not invisible to our families. And I think that's another thing that your book your book points out beautifully. Yeah, I, I, I want to just go back one little bit to something you said, Jessica, about um, it's, a, it's a personal story, but it's universal. It's really true. And, and um, some of the things I've been reading in the response to this book are that other people are going through the same thing, even down to, okay, now we have our family meeting scheduled. And I think, oh yes, I know exactly what that is. Uh, so that's the sharing platter again, even though that person will, be, will go to a family meeting, it will be very much different than the one that I experienced. But the value in talking about the family meeting is to let people kind of know what what they might expect that you might feel this way too and and we're all in this together it just helps to know you're not alone in this and also um that one of the one of the things that i think or that i hope anyway uh helps keep this from being maudlin um oh, no. are the moments of humor and and uh, or of you know triumph like Walter walking up the aisle but when my dad was tested um oh, that was a great they gave him um a series of of questions to answer or a task to perform that was it it was is these tasks and then the person who administered the test was adding up his score and she's saying okay you got four out of five on this one you got three out of five on this one and, and there were I don't know let's say 10 different categories. And when she was going to get the average, she whips out her calculator and my dad said 4.5. And he was exactly <laughs> right. And honestly, it was, oh, I just wanted to stand up and cheer. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. And it is, it is, it is humorous. It's not uh, ha ha funny so much, but it is, it is those things that we can resonate to. I keep using that word, but that's the word 
um, you know, that comes to mind. And maybe when you're talking about the response you've gotten or this response that I'm sure you will get much more of now that the book has just come out, um, I was thinking about the phrase that you used, uh, moral hangover that you have. It's funny, it's I'll be seeing you is the perfect title for this book, you know, given everything that it talks about in your parents' love story. Um, which spanned 70, 70 years, is that right? I have to say the more poignant lines to me of that song are in all the old familiar places. Yeah. And I know that it's so relevant to this book because um, exactly what you talked about at the beginning, you suffered this moral hangover from, to use your word, forcing your parents to leave their most familiar place of 45 years, is that mm -hmm. right? To go to a place that they that they did not know at all and weren't happy about going to. And I, I wondered if you wanted to, for those people, the readers who might, you know, now or soon be experiencing something like that, do you want to describe that a, a bit? Um, I, I think what was particularly difficult for my sister and me, I have a brother, but he lives in Hawaii. So he, he wasn't there for a lot of this. Um, but what was, Hardest for us was the way that my parents kept going back and forth. It was, in fact, my mother's idea uh, at first to move, um, although she talked about to a condo from the house. But as, as things got increasingly more difficult in the sense that um, my dad grew more confused, uh, my parents had gotten older and going up and down steps was, was getting a little dangerous. They live in Minnesota. To take the trash out, they had to go down the steps and down an icy walk into the alley, et cetera, et cetera. Those little things that you never think about suddenly become really challenging. So one would want to go and then and the other wouldn't, and then their roles would reverse. So when when it became so hard to um, mind them, in a sense, to mind them, to keep an eye on them, to make sure they were safe, to get them where they needed to go, and so on, we began thinking about all the things that the place where uh, we wanted them to move could offer them. And we, we brought them over there. We talked to people. We looked at the apartment. It seemed like everything was fine. And then uh, right before they moved, my mom's sister and best friend died. And that really threw a wrench into the work. So she was dealing with her husband leaving her, you know, in the way that people with Alzheimer's leave before they leave. She'd lost her sister. Now she was losing her house. It was too much. It was too much. And th the place where you put that kind of sadness sometimes is rage and you act out against others. Uh, and it's perfectly understandable. But when you're the one who's being acted out upon, you get enraged yourself. Uh, you talked about the moral hangover aspect of it, even though my parents wanted to go somewhere um, and then kind of backed away from it and then kind of went toward it. I began to get this feeling that in the end, the only reason they're doing this is because we really are sort of manipulating them and forcing them. And um, it's to help us too. So I felt really guilty about that, even though I knew it was the most practical and the safest thing to do. And that many, many others have gone through this and will go through this. And the thing to do on this slide, you talk about having cancer and thinking it's all going down, down, down. The thing to remember on your way down, 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 and that is the direction they were going, is to look off to the side and see what else is happening. So, um, that's what I hoped for them is that they would move to this place and it would be an adjustment, but eventually they would come to terms with it and it could even be good. And that is what happens. So for anyone who's reading the book, don't worry. <laughs> In the end, it turns out, it turns out to be a, a kind of peaceful acceptance, a place of grace, really. I know that's the word that you said, uh, going through all the, that acceptance was the the end point there. And I, I know that since the, in the epilogue, I mean, the book has been published now after both of your parents died. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how, I wondered how it was for you um, in terms of thinking about the, the loved ones that we have who have died, because I know that my own experience, uh, first 
the first very uh, close death that I had was my grandmother. I had her till I was 30. She even said that to me toward the end. You had me till you were 30. So she knew that it was that, that valuable. And she also told me I was her favorite and also told one of my cousins that she was her favorite. I think we, were both <laughs> her favorites. we found that out later. But, um, you know, I found that I had to work really hard because my memories of her were at the end because they were so intense and so vivid. And I really had to work for at remembering the early stuff, everything that came before. And I think that that's what you do in this book. I mean, you certainly talk about how it is, you know, toward the end and at the end, but you also talk about your parents beforehand. And I hope that that's where, um, I don't know whether my experience is, is I, I have no idea whether it's common or not, whether people who've lost people tend to think of them at the end because it's so, it's just vivid, you know, it's just yeah. very vivid to you. It's the, it's the last thing. Um, so I, I, I hope that you have had the experience of having the whole, you're remembering them, you know, throughout their lives and throughout your life. Sounds yeah, like yeah. It, one of the things that's in the book and an anecdote that I truly love has to do with my dad. And, the, and this will tell you everything you need to know about the love he had for her. But he was on a ship in World War II. That's, that's, he, he delivered supplies back and forth. And so he was posted, as they say, to a ship. And um, mail call came and he got a letter from my mom and it was handed to him and it blew out of his hand and he jumped in the ocean to get it. And I said to him, why did you do that? <laughs> Crazy. And he said, I don't know, I guess I just didn't think about it. <laughs> he wanted the letter. He it was wanted the letter. He wanted everything. He, he wanted, you know, when, when my sister and I tried to take him out, well, we did take, take him out because he needed some clothes because um, he'd lost so much weight. Uh, he, did, he never wanted to leave my mother and she was all for it. She needed a break, you know, go, go, have a nice time, have lunch, maybe even have dinner, just go. <laughs> and and um, he, he, it was so hard for him to leave her and, because something might happen to her. And my mother said, what? What might happen to me? And he drew himself up in this righteous indignation and said, you could fall for one thing. So, so even when he was so mightily compromised, he was still trying to take care of her. After they moved into the, the new apartment, he had a mobility scooter and he used to drive it up to the door and park it there. So nobody could break in. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I, I love that. And I, I wondered if just, I was curious about the process since you have written so much fiction, was it a different process writing the nonfiction? Because I also saw, I know you're an admirer of E.B. White who said, you don't want to look too much under the hood when you're writing. Yeah. It yeah. also seemed to me that this is a book that kind of requires looking under the hood. So I, I wondered if you had a different experience with this book than with your novels you know the the way that i write is so freeform jessica it's it's just it's just a falling into trust and and letting the story emerge uh, and and i i guess um the memoir was different in that these were real events and it was painful to recall a lot of these things and it was embarrassing to admit my own failings but in the in the way that um, I want to leave myself in order to facilitate telling a story, the same thing happened. If I, if I think about what I'm writing, um, then I can't write. I always think of, of George Sand um, trying to explain this phenomenon of, of being in, in what amounts to a, a trance really when you write. And, and so her interviewer said, aha, so you don't think when you're writing. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you think, but it's not, it's not calculated. It's not, um, okay, now I've done this scene. Now I'm going to do this one. It, it wasn't like that at all. It was kind of a stream of consciousness trying to keep up with what was going on. And if, if people have not read The Dream Lover, they can read more about Elizabeth's reimagining of George Sand, right? <laughs> I think that that's the, I got the title, right? The Dream Lover? Yes, The Dream Lover. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I know we're going to soon um, want to hear questions from other people. I wanted to, let's see, I wanted to say, I didn't want to let this quote go without mentioning it, because even though it's also not about your parents, it's my favorite line in the book. Uh, well, there are two. One is when you have your mother standing on your shoulder after she's died saying, loosen your laces and remember that love can be more than one thing. I thought that was beautiful. But you have that line that's almost like a throwaway line. It's just in there about whatever your age, you are picnicking with your back to a forest full of bears. And I just love that because to me, that reminds us that of, of the honesty. I mean, we can choose to keep our back turned and eventually the bears are gonna come around or we could turn slightly and look at the bears. But I just thought that was a wonderful way of saying that, you know, um, we can choose, you know, to see different things that are around us, whether it's the danger, whether it's the humor. And I, I thought that was a fabulous line, just, just wonderful. You know, thank you, Jessica. I like that way too. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's... Didn't you think, um, you know, going back to, to the commonality that we share of having cancer, did you have this thought that, you know, people usually think, why me when this kind of thing happens? And it occurred to me when I was diagnosed, well, why not me? I mean, why not me? These kinds of things go on all the time. Life is dangerous and we forget that. We, we're not forgetting it so much these days, but we, we tend to go into denial and not, and not think about the many things that can happen every day, which is another reason that we should be so extraordinarily grateful for every day that we do have full of such riches. Uh, but it's, it's human nature, I guess, too. Well, that's, yeah, and I didn't mean to cut you, but that's exactly the reason that I love that line is that it makes you more aware of the days when those things don't happen, when their bears don't come out, and when you yeah. do have good things and you have those things to um, appreciate. It's really, um, uh, yes, I don't know, I, I, it's, a, it's a gift. As aging is, you make a point of saying that, you know, you, mm -hmm. you lose some things, but you gain other things that you would never have predicted you might have you know, this many years on. Um, I, want, I, I want to ask you to end our section before questions by reading a little more. I think you said you had another, but I, I just also wanted to ask you, I'm, I'm guessing, I want to just confirm this for myself. You'd say that your parents' story uh, had an imperfect, but a happy ending. Is that a fair, uh, I was thinking about that because I thought it's not, it's not the way, you know, when you first, when they got married, they probably thought about how things would be, you know, that many years later, but it was uh, maybe another way to say it is the best it could have been given. Yeah. Don't you think that when people take their marriage vows, if people do this anymore, when they get to the, in the, in sickness and in health, and usually when people get married, they're pretty young and they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sickness and in health, whatever. Yeah. Hurry up. Let's, let's get this over with so we can go make out, you know, but, but they ought to say, now, listen, I'm going to marry you two, but I want to talk for a while about in sickness and in health. So that they are, should just take that apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not going to gloss over this. Believe me, it'll help you later on. Of course, it wouldn't help them later on because they'd instantly forget right. and deny it. Yes. But, you can't. I, I mean, that's that's a gift of being young that you can't know what yeah. you know when we're older. And yeah. uh, so, um, so Elizabeth, it's it's been such a pleasure. I would love to ask you to, um, to read a section before oh. Ginny returns to field questions yes. that we may have. Yes, and thank you again, Jessica. I, I am, it, you know, what a pleasure to see you. I'm, I'm sorry it can only be this way, but I, I treasure seeing you again. And the only thing missing is that snickered Snickers pie oh, that we I, used. I think it was peanut butter. It was, it was peanut butter, as I recall. We may have to, we may have to compare notes. We used to go to lunch Snickers at a certain place that had a certain dessert people yeah that, that, <laughs> yes. we had, that we had every time but um i want to just read a, a very brief part it's a page and a half very near the end of the book but it won't spoil anything for you and i think it will speak to many of the things that we um brought up here i have a friend whose elderly mother lives with her and is driving her crazy her mother was once a talented artist an intellectual with myriad interests. Now, my friend says, 
she gets up in the morning and makes a cup of coffee and she's so slow doing it. I mean, I just watch her sometimes to see how she can possibly be so slow. Then she sits at the kitchen table and talks about what might be for lunch. I just can't stand it. All she talks about is her cup of coffee in the morning and the weather and what her next meal will be. I really wonder, is there any meaning to the end of life? I suppose one way to answer that question is to think about how a baby's meaning in life is a ray of sunshine, the color red, the nearness of his mother's flesh. For a teenager, it is music, fitting in, hormone management. In midlife, meaning comes from focusing on our families, our jobs, our involvement with the world outside our kitchens, which is to say that the meaning of life is ever changing, even as we are. Who's to say that the richest time of life might not be when a cup of morning coffee fills the world? If you found a holy man hidden away on a mountain who found fulfillment in such seemingly simple things, would you not admire him? It is a very warm summer morning and my parents are both alive and ambulatory. They are still capable of enjoying a slice of apple pie and of having a conversation. They are living together in what will probably be the last home they will ever share. Imagine them at the kitchen table. My mother will serve breakfast on the embroidered tablecloth. The day will pass. Laundry will be done. The mail will be gotten. The phone will be answered. People they pass in the hall will be acknowledged. Lunch and dinner will be eaten. Someone may drop by for a visit. In the evening, the television will be on and they will sit watching their shows. They will go to bed together. My father has never and will not now go to bed without my mother. And while the moon follows an ancient path across the night sky, they will lie next to each other with their eyes closed. In the morning, the first thing they see will be each other. That's so beautiful, Elizabeth. And I can tell people who are attending tonight who have not read it that the book is filled with lines like that. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> hi, well, that, hi. Well, that has been that's been fantastic. Thank you so much. I I, I continually remember that some of the beauty of I'm continually reminded that the beauty of books is that you see things in a way that you haven't experienced yet. I am just reaching the stage where caring for parents is becoming a part of my daily life. I'm fortunate actually to still have my grandmother who's 91. We're moving her actually to a, to a retirement place right now. And, um, you know, I'm seeing my mother to care for my grandmother as she gets older, but then also approaching and doing that myself for both myself and my husband's parents. And I, you know, I, it's not something I've experienced, but in reading books like this in such beautiful language as you have, you, you, you really understand it. It really, creates that empathy, which I think is so important. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. I, I, I take that away from tonight personally myself. Sure, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so um, I will get off my own soapbox and <laughs> get to the questions in the chat here. Um, one fan is asking, uh, may I ask, what is the one takeaway, Elizabeth, that, or that you, Elizabeth, would like us to have from this book? I, I want the book to be a source of comfort and um, for, for you to understand that you'll get through it, that there's more more to it than you might think. Um, there's, as Jessica was talking about, there's more beauty to it. There's more depth to it. It's worth it to go through it. And um, I guess that's enough to, <laughs> to to say that I I hope they take away. And 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 I hope I guess I hope as a, as a writer that reading it is a pleasure. I mean, for me as a writer. <laughs> excuse me, what I always look for in a book is the voice, is the writing. <clears throat> That's what matters to me most. So I hope that um, while there may be some things you gain from reading this in the practical sense, you will also just appreciate um, the writing. Absolutely. Uh, so Connie says, at some point during my dad's Alzheimer's, he stopped being able to talk. Do you address this in your book and what it's like to not be able to communicate well with your parent? Um, yes, my, my father did not lose the ability to talk altogether. 
but uh, he certainly wasn't himself. There was a very poignant to me moment when I was taking him somewhere, I think to get a haircut. And he said, I just feel like I'm in a fog. And I think that that was a moment of clarity for him to understand that he did feel like he was in a fog. And there was just, there was nothing I could offer him against that other than to say, I hear you. I, I said, do you? And he didn't really talk anymore about it. But I think the merciful thing about these kinds of situations is that they happen incrementally so that you can you have a better chance of being able to deal with them. Okay, that's done. And then and then the new thing happens and then you deal with that. But love works. It really does work. And it 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 stays too. Um, Angie asked, how soon after your parents passing did you decide that to make your experience into a memoir or was it while they or one of them were still alive? Um, well, as I said earlier, I wrote, I wrote this to sort of keep track of things to, you know, what do they want? Where are we in this situation? And also as therapy for myself. After, um, after I got pretty far into it, I began feeling that this might be able to help other people. I, I, this is uh, documented in the book too, but I brought this question to my writers group because it's a dilemma really. Do I publish something like this that is so personal that is not just about me, but is revealing of a lot of other people in the book? Is that fair? And I think that's a question that a lot of people who write memoir have to ask themselves and even people who write fiction. Um, but in the end, um, every woman in my writers group, and these are highly intelligent and empathic people, said you really should publish this. The, the real uh, permission giving came from my sister. I sent her the manuscript in the same way that I sent my mom the, the manuscript for Durable Goods. I sent her the manuscript and I said, are you okay with this? If you think there's anything I should change or if I shouldn't publish it, just tell me, um, it's fine. And she wrote me back a two word email in all caps that said, publish this. Mm. So I did. <laughs> well, someone just asked if how your siblings felt about the book. So that ties in quite nicely. What you have other siblings though, right? I have a brother. Right. And, and um, he, ha he has just received the book and his wife snatched it away from him because she wanted to read it first. <laughs> and, um, my brother is, is an incredibly sensitive person. And I, and I told him, you're going to have a hard time with some parts of these book, some parts of this book, but you'll be okay. And so I'll wait to hear if that's really true, but I think it will be. Okay. Uh, Sue asks, how old were you when your parents were dealing with your dad's Alzheimer's? Oh, um, well, I'm 70. Actually, you know, the book says I'm 70 years old. Actually, I'm 71 and will be 72 in December. That's how long it took to come out. So this, this took place over a couple of years. So do the math. Okay. I was going to ask. Two trains was... are going down the track. 1.60. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask if this was all, uh, you know, was, was, I can't remember now, was this your original publication date or did it get moved back because of the pandemic? No, this was the original date. Right. Yeah. What is it? I mean, publishing a book right now is a very, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? For both of you to, to know what oh, it's happened yeah. like this year. Yeah. And, and also, and Jessica, I'm sure can speak to this too, but the whole PC thing, um, and um, the care that publishers are taking to be inclusive now, it's in, in many ways, it's a very good thing, but it's also a, a nervous time. And publishing is very much different from when I started. Um, there are not the boutique publishers there, there used to be. And um, it's risky business. It just is. Right. Jessica, how's your experience been? Well, I, I, we were talking a little bit before about the one nice thing about it is that, you know, I normally couldn't go to a, a reading of Elizabeth's in Chicago. 
And even if I lived there, it would be hard to find a parking spot. So this is, it is nice to be able to have people from all over come to your readings and your, but it is, it's, it's, uh, it's good in some ways, bad in others. I suppose it's like a lot of other things, but absolutely. I suppose it can't, and I can't dictate what we write. I guess we just have to do what we're going to do. Well, it's like you both said earlier, you have to be able to experience the beauty of it. You know, you, you got to, to make that choice, right? You got to say that you're going to experience it this way or not because you're here to do it, so. Right, right. right. Yeah, but to, to your point, Ginny, I just wanna to say too, and I, and I think everyone here, thank you for being here, by the way. I think everybody here knows this, but independents are struggling now and, if, if you can buy your books from independent bookstores rather than other places, it's, it's so very important. Um, they're, they're a big part of the community and it's just so hard for businesses right now. So when you think of um, where you're gonna buy your book, think of your independent. Even if they don't have the book, they can get it for you. And um, also, you know, the holidays are coming. Books make great presents. Anderson's is famous for their children's books, you know, and, and children's books go such a long way toward forming those little characters. And, and um, uh, if you can read during these times, it's such a, such a comfort. So um, I, I've learned a lot about books I want to read from watching author presentations. And I think I have 60 books on my nightstand, but you know, it's a comfort to me to know I can go shopping in my bedroom and <laughs> choose what I'm going to read that night. Oh, that is so kind of you to say you, you, you've done all of our marketing work for us. It's, I, <laughs> I'm just going to take that video and put it everywhere. Elizabeth Berg says, <laughs> oh, you are very kind. No, it is true. It is, it is difficult right now for, for many, many businesses, but independent businesses in general, especially, we don't have big corporations that are you know, backing us up and, and stockholders and money in reserves for things. Um, and in the bookstores, it's been an interesting year, that is for sure. But um, with with help of, of readers and authors, we are very committed to doing everything we can to, to hold on to the very, <laughs> what I, well, hopefully the last gasp is many, many, many years from now. Isn't it the case to you that, that bookshop.org is, is a place where the independents have their own pages and that's a, that's a clear. Many do. Yeah. If, if, okay. if you are, um, don't have a local bookstore near you, um, you can actually order online from, you know, a direct book, a direct website from any independent in the country. I mean, if you're in, you know, if you're not in Boston, you can still order for Har from Harvard bookshop, um, for example, and have it shipped to you. But, um, if you don't have a store that you are, um, affiliated with, then bookshop.org is a wonderful way to, um, support just independence in general. Not every store has a page and not every store is benefit, but it, they's, they've done some amazing work this year. Originally that was actually built for um, affiliates. So if you know BuzzFeed was doing a list of the top 10 books of the month for them to link to something like Bookshop instead of perhaps some other website that they might link to, um, to give people who publish those kinds of things online a choice on where to send their links to. But it has proved invaluable for many a store this year. Um, you know, many smaller stores don't have an online store that they can send to. So um, that's been very valuable. But thank you both for bringing up all of those. Remember, when this is all over, you're going to want to go out. And one of the places you're going to want to go is to a bookstore for that wonderful yes. browsing yes. thing where you just wander around and find things by accident. It's all well and good to know that you want to get a book. Maybe you want to get the Gretchen question. Maybe you want to get, I'll be seeing you. But it's so wonderful when you wander around and find something by accident. Yes. Something that just calls to you. So Yes, we, we there's a campaign right now that, uh, you know, any bookstores don't curate by algorithm. We curate by reading the books and talking to people on what they want next. So right. again, you're making my points for me, Elizabeth. I should just <laughs> let you do this. <laughs> Well, right before we go, I want to ask if either of you, I know you both had books out this year, so this feels like a little bit of an early question, but what else are you working on next? Elizabeth, I noted in the chat, people want to know what you're working on. And, and I'm uh, one of them, so what are you? What what, are you okay, uh, I want to know what you're working on. Too, but, um, <laughs> I, well, I wrote um, what became a trilogy, much to my surprise, I didn't intend it to be, but it's uh, the story of Arthur True Love followed by Night of Miracles followed by the Confession Club, and I'm now doing the fourth. Um, I'm I was I thought I was done, but I put the toothpick in, and there was still batter on it, so I'm not I'm not as done as I thought. But it will be done soon, so there will be a fourth um, Mason book Wonderful. titled We Don't Know. 
We don't know the title. What are you doing, Jessica? Well, I actually did, I, I'm kind of putting the finishing touches on a book of stories that I don't know wh whether it will see the light of day, but I enjoyed writing them and felt gratified by writing them. So um, that's what I did because I followed the Elizabeth Berg ethos of write what you want to write and write what's in your heart. And um, that worked for me. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. I told Jessica many years ago, just quit your job. The universe will provide. You remember that? See, I remember that. She said the universe will provide. It's been in my head and I did and it has. So I, I can't promise that that will work too for everyone else. But there is something about following good advice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, wonderful. Well, it has been just lovely to have the two of you with us this evening and for everyone that's joining us from home um, or wherever you may be. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, been a cheery to this sort of cold, dark evening here in Chicago anyway. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, yes, yes. I would imagine so. <laughs> um, and for sharing your time for all of you, we really do appreciate that. Um, if you ordered a copy of the book, um, those will be available in the next couple of days, as I mentioned, um, although I guess this is before we started, we're, we're still waiting for our stock to come in and then Elizabeth will come sign them. So we will contact you when those are available um, to be picked up or to be shipped out. So just hang tight and be patient with us. Um, as I like to remind us, we are actually people in a basement putting things in boxes and humans sending them out as opposed to a robot. So <laughs> we appreciate your patience as, um, as it's a little bit busy, but um, everybody, uh, thank you. Have a great evening. Stay healthy, stay safe out there. And thanks, thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yes, wonderful. All right, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.